Good morning, saints. Uh, thank you, Dr. Brian, for, for the prayer and encouraging words. Uh, it's good to be here this morning. It's interesting that uh, today's message, I'm going to speak about prayer, as you have um, pleaded with everyone that we should pray for our fellow saints uh, in this house. Uh, definitely, God is doing something in this house, and we need to ensure that uh, we're going to be part of this. So we continue in the book of Acts. Today I'll be looking into chapter, Acts chapter 12. Previous week, uh, as uh, Margot has been saying, that uh, Uncle Brian touched on the message, uh, love is an action. And indeed it is because if we look at John 3, 16, God so loved the word that he did something about it. There was an action behind it, and that's what we learned. And he shared that love towards us, and we should share it with the rest of the world. Do catch that message if you haven't uh, already. So today I'm going to speak to you on prayer. So let's quickly jump on to uh, Acts chapter 12, and it reads as follows. About that time, King Herod violently attacked some who belonged to the church. And he executed James, John's brother, with the sword. When he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter too. During the festival of the unleavened bread. After the arrest, he put him in the prison and assigned four squads of soldiers, each uh, to guard him, intending to bring him out to the people after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was praying fervently to, uh, to God for him. When Herod was about to bring him out for trial, that very night, Peter, bound with two chains, was sleeping between the soldiers. While the sentries in front of the door guarded the prison, suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. Striking Peter on the side, he woke him up and said, Quickly, get up! And the chains fell off. And the chains fell off his wrist. Get dressed, the angel, of, the angel told him, and put on your sandals. And he did. Wrap your cloak around you, he told him, and follow me. So he went out and followed, and he did not know that what the angel did was really happening. It was really happening, but he thought he was seeing a vision. After they passed the first and the second guards, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened to them by itself. They went outside and passed one street, and suddenly the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he, saw, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel, and rescued me from Herod's grasp and from all the Jewish people and, and from all what the Jewish people expected. As soon as he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was called Mark, where many had assembled and were praying. He knocked at the door of the outer gate and a servant named Rhoda came to answer. She recognized Peter's voice, and because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing at the outer gate. You're out of your mind, they told her. But she kept on insisting that it was true, and they said, and they said it, it's his angel. Peter, however, kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were amazed. Motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell these things to James and the brothers, he said. Now, this is the other James, uh, uh, Jesus' uh, half-brother. He said, and he left and went to another place at daylight. There was a great commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. Um, I'll stop there. So, we learn in this scripture that uh, there was political power that had raised its ugly hand against the church. 
And we see this uh, with the death of James. What we asked ourselves is that when James was captured uh, to be killed, the church prayed, but still uh, James got killed. You know, and, 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 and it is such a thing that makes, uh, that sort of bring about confusion in the church when, when it comes to prayer to say, I've prayed for a particular uh, situation, yet uh, the answer didn't come through. What does it mean? And that's what we're going to look into this morning. We know that uh, he, uh, him and his brother John, they wanted to sit at the right and the left side of Jesus in his glory. And we see that in, in, in Mark 10, chapter 35, uh, where, where, where they request uh, an audience with Jesus and actually ask him if that we could sit on the right and your left uh, in your glory. Uh, but here it turns out that when uh, James was arrested, he, he then got killed. Uh, could that have led the the people to think that you know, uh, maybe they are immune to the persecution that the church uh, was, experience, was experiencing, especially the 12 apostles, because they were that close to Jesus. Could the church maybe have not prayed fervently for, for James? We ask ourselves that question this morning. You know, could it be that their praying was not sincere because of the previous victories of the church? We know that uh, Peter and John were brought in front of the Sanhedrin in, in, in Acts chapter 4. And they were threatened and told to never preach the gospel ever again. But they were later released. And then those are some of the victories that we see in, in the book of Acts. Uh, when, when, when the disciples pray that maybe they thought uh, even James would be released. You know, we don't really have to be, you know, intense in prayer you know, it could be one of these things. I mean, and also James was one of the three uh, uh, apostles who, we, we, who, what the Bible scholars tell us, is the inner circles. They were always there in, in one of those interesting situations, like uh, at the Mount of Transfiguration. The three of them were there, you know. So could it have been that they thought, ah, not this one, they will never touch him. He was that close to Christ. But Unfortunately, it happened that he got killed, you know. And up until now, none of the 12 apostles have been martyred. James became the first one. And maybe that sort of brought about an awakening to say, oh, no. Uh, no one is immune to the schemes of the devil, you know. The devil respects no one. He even tried to tempt Jesus. Even knowing who Jesus was, he tried his luck, you know. So what, 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 what we're seeing here is that there is absolutely nothing new under the sun. Even when Jesus was born, babies were martyred uh, by uh, Herod. It was an unjust uh, massacre of, of little babies because someone wanted to hold on to political power. And we also see it with this Herod that he wanted to impress the Jews because he wanted to hold on a lot longer. Uh, uh, to power and, and by making sure that him and the, and the Jewish leadership, so to speak, not the Jews, but the Jewish leadership or religious leadership, they were in, in, in some form of uh, working relationship. He pleased them and they would probably do something for him in return also as a, as, as a political leader. And we probably do see that even in the times that we live in where you find some ungodly relationship between political leaders and religious leaders. It happens even in our times. There's nothing new under the sun. The book of Ecclesiastes tells us that. Now, it, it happens that uh, later on in, in, in Acts chapter 12, verse 3, Peter also uh, gets arrested, you know. It says, uh, when they saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter to, during the festival of the unleavened bread. So we see that now he realizes that this uh, thi thing of him uh, murdering the, the, the apostles seems to be working for his political career. 
But we do know that the devil is, is behind this as well. But what, what, what I liked about what we, in this account, we see that um, even though Peter is arrested, um, when, the angels arrive, when the angel of the Lord arrived in jail, he finds him sleeping. He is at peace, you know. He knows he's arrested and he's probably going to get killed. Uh, Paul wouldn't have fallen asleep if I was in his situation, but he was asleep. But I think Peter may, may have remembered uh, the words of, of our Lord Jesus Christ when he told him that in this world uh, you will have uh, tribulation. So he was expecting that there will be trials and, uh, 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 there will be trials and tribulations, but uh, is it something we expect as, as believers in this house? Do we expect that we will go through trials and tribulations? And when they do come, do we panic? What is our response? How do we respond to trials and challenges in, in the life that we live in? We need to ask ourselves that question this morning. But in Psalm uh, 127, uh, chapter, I mean, chap Psalm 127, verse 2, it reads as follows. In vain you will get up early and stay up uh, late working hard to have enough food. Yes, he gives sleep to the ones he loves. So in, 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 in this psalm, what we learn is that God gives sleep to the ones he loves. We need to understand that. Hence, uh, when I look at what Peter went through, I mean, he, he was fast asleep before the angel dropped up. It says the light shone. Some people are light sleepers. As soon as there's some movement, they just jump. Hey, what's that? You know, Swako, wake up. Someone is in the house, you know. That time you're scared. You know, but you're someone's pillar of strength, so you gotta get up and go in. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, but God gives sleep to his children. And if we look at the story of Paul and Silas, well, when they were arrested, they continued to worship the Lord. You know, they were at peace. Daniel in the lion's den, he, 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 he continued to be, you know, to keep focus on who created the lions, not what the lions were about to do to him, you know. And then the one that uh, I also like, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and, and Abednego, just before they were thrown into the furnace, they said, even if God doesn't rescue us, even if. And I pray, it's my prayer this morning, that we also have uh, that uh, understanding that as well, that even if we live in the midst of a pandemic, God is our healer. Even if we live in the in, in, in midst of economic uncertainty, God is our provider. Let's, let's have that, that stance, knowing who he is. Because he loves his children, he gives sleep to, the, sleep to the one he loves. Let us not forget that. So with the increasing uh, persecution to the church, the church responds the way the church is supposed to. They pray for Peter fervently this time. And they don't pray just for one day, because Peter, Peter was in jail for a couple of days, and, and they continued to pray for him. They didn't uh, do one short prayer and that's it. We move on, you know. They continue to, and, and uh, if we uh, look at the scripture in James uh, chapter 5, verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. So if we live righteously, if we are in right standing with God, then our prayer life will be effective. And there are ways in which we can get to a place where we are in right standing with God. His grace allows us to be the righteous. His grace allows us to come to his throne and where we've come short and we can ask him to forgive us, we can ask him to strengthen us, we can ask him to make us, to give us his righteousness so that when we make prayer for our fellow saints, and it must be a fervent prayer, uh, 
it will have its effect as, as we desire, of course, within the sovereignty of God. Let's not forget that. That at the end of the day, God's will will stand. But God has foreordained prayer as a means in which we can get his will done in our lives here on earth. Amen. So, what we learn from Peter being released is that God can break the, cha- God, God can break the chains of sin flesh and the world and the schemes of the enemy that uh, keeps us from uh, spending fellowship with him, spending time with him. So we need to be in a place where we could pray for the salvation of people in our community, in our families, and even people we work with. Because the unfortunate part is that there are people who don't know that they need prayer, but they need prayer. And we are in that uh, position to make that call to say, you know, let me take some time and pray for so and so. We see here that intercessory prayer really, really, really uh, helped uh, in the situation of Peter. Peter got released because they spent time praying for him. It's unfortunate that in the world we live in, the day and age, there is so much of uh, prosperity gospel that our prayer language tends to be more for selfish gain, you know, than for seeking the will of God. And that has stolen such precious prayer time that the saints could use, you know, to help others, you know, to show and share the love of God with one another. It's unfortunate that such things uh, prop up within the church family, but we praise the living God and he will give us discernment to know when and what to do. And he empowers us with his spirit, which... uh, prompts us in various situations where we need to pray or where we need to descend, you know. The, the, another thing is that in, uh, if we look at Joel uh, chapter 2, verse 17, Joel chapter 2, verse 17, it says, let the priest, the Lord's minister, weep between the uh, portico and the altar. Let them say, have pity on your people, Lord, and do not make your inheritance a disgrace and an object of scorn among the nations. Why should it say among the people, where is their God? And people might say that as well with our loved ones, when they see maybe our loved ones or our friends going through what they're going through. They may look at us who are Christians to say, where is their God? Why can't they pray? to their God to help this person and that person. So this scripture says we must plead with God fervently, you know. We must plead for our people. We must plead for our loved ones and pray for them and ask God to rescue them. The same way we see how Peter was rescued. May they be rescued from the schemes of the enemy when we pray for them, you know. And also, we need to learn to pray as a collective. It's very important that we recognize that in, the, in, the, in, in Acts chapter 12, that they prayed as a collective. And there's also a scripture in Second Corinthians chapter 1, uh, verse 11, which goes as follows. While you join in helping us by your prayers, then many will give thanks on on your behalf for the gift that came to us through the prayers of many. It says through the prayers of many. You know, the gift came as a result of the prayers of many. It is very important that we also pray as a collective. And I am glad that in this house we have this monthly prayer session that we have and in, in different households where we gather together as a collective to pray. It's pressing times that we live in. We need to pray even more now than ever. And we need to pray right. Um, we, 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 we shouldn't assume anything. And well, well, what, what I learned from, 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 from the scriptures is that when they had to appoint uh, Matthias, the 12th apostle, who was going to replace Judas, who betrayed Jesus, they prayed and the two names came up and even then 
after that, they casted lots to make sure that there's no human bias. It is God's will that is taking place. Yes, we don't do that uh, this day and age where we do things like the casting of lots because the Holy Spirit guides us uh, in, many, in many of the situations. This is one of the few uh, incidences in the New Testament where the custom of lots is used, but it's mostly used in the Old Testament. And also, when we pray, sometimes when we pray, we, we, we get uh, answers to our prayers, but we mustn't lose sight, you know. In Luke 10, they, 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 they say that, Lord, uh, even demons are subject uh, to, to us when we pray in your name. They got very excited about it. But Jesus said, uh, be careful because what you need to be concerned about is that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. So sometimes when you're getting your prayer being answered, you might get overly excited and lose out on the fundamentals. I mean, we, there's a scripture in, in, in the Bible where Jesus says, uh, uh, get away from me, me. I never knew you. You were a of unrighteousness, you know. But they, but they say, Lord, Lord, we cast out devils in your name. They raised that concern. But he said, I never knew you. So even in our prayer life, even as, as we see uh, our prayers being answered, let us not lose uh, sight. Let us not lose uh, the fundamentals of, 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 of our faith, you know, to abide in Christ and let his word abide in us also. That's very important, you know. And also, you know, you, you need to live right to pray right. Uh, you can't live uh, a lifestyle that is contrary to your faith. It, it will affect your prayer life in a big way, you know. I can't come and stand here and encourage you uh, to pray, but I'm ill-treating my wife at home. I mean, in one of the epistles of Peter, it tells you that your prayers will be hindered if you don't treat your wife, you know, we, we, we get some of those examples in, in the scripture that teaches us, you know, what we ought to do in order to pray right, you know. And we need to be aware that uh, in order to live right, it is by the grace of God. It is by the grace of God, God will equip us to be able to live a righteous and a sanctified life. In our own strength, in our own effort, we will fail dismally. So we need his grace upon us daily to be able to sustain us, to strengthen us, to help us in our walk with, uh, with Christ. And we need to be aware that we are not Im immune to the devil's temptation. Like I've said earlier, um, the devil respects no one. I mean, there was a joke that was circulating in the social media where someone said, why do pastors need an invigilator when they write exams? They shouldn't be cheating. But the truth is, the devil respects no one. He might tempt someone to want to copy answers. You know, we need to make sure, you know, that doesn't happen. So, yeah, he respects no one. And so we need to be careful about that, you know. One of, of, of my favorite uh, uh, yesterday pastors likes to say, uh, no man is greater than his prayer life. No man is greater than his prayer life. And if you look at the prayer life of Jesus, you can see that. There was something about Jesus' prayer life that even the disciples went to him and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. They saw something. They never said, teach us how to preach or teach us how to worship. They said, teach us how to pray. They saw something in Jesus' prayer life, you know. So, a prayer life is important. God has ordained this for us, and we need to use it, and we need to use it right, you know. Even uh, it tells us in the Bible that Daniel used to pray three times a day. And don't get, get caught up in the number that he prayed three times. It is the commitment behind it that you need to pay attention to. He was committed to praying. He understood the importance of prayer, you know. And another scripture that I want us to probably read, it's Proverbs uh, chapter 28, verse 9. Uh, who is it, if you can maybe flight that for us? Proverbs uh, 28, uh, chapter 9. 
it's, it reads as follows. One who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. I want to read that again. One who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. We need to spend time reading the word of God. What if maybe what's affecting our prayer life is that we don't spend time in the word. We don't spend time reading the word. And our prayer ends up being an abomination in the sight of God. I'd like to overly emphasize the scripture this morning. That we need to spend time in the word of God. It is very important that we do that. So, before I close, I think in what I would like us to take away from what we learned uh, this morning is that we, we shouldn't wait for the situation to get worse before we pray fervently. Perhaps when uh, James was captured, the church didn't pray as fervent as they, had, they, they did when they prayed for Peter. So let's not wait for life situation to get out of hand before we can have a fervent prayer life, you know. Some military strategists once uh, wrote that if you sweat during peacetime, you will bleed less during war. We need to get ourselves in, 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 in a lifestyle of prayer so that when those difficult situations come, it, it's sort of almost like a reflex to pray. You know, it's not a drag, it's not a pardon, you know. Your position in Christ doesn't make you immune to persecution. Remember that. Fellowship with the saints, it's very, very critical. When you're in trouble, there would be people who know that you need prayers. And they will pray for you and they will pray with you. Fellowship with the saints, it's very critical. Because there might be one or two people here who have uh, the spiritual gifts that might edify you. So being isolated and alone, it puts you in harm's way. So never neglect uh, fellowshipping with the saints. And also if we look at how they, they were shocked when Rhoda told them that Peter is at the door, they couldn't believe it. But what we can take out of that is that little faith in the right God, it's better than great faith in your own capabilities and connections and resources. Amen. Yeah. So what, what, what we need to know is that uh, prayer is not about getting our will done, but getting God's will done in our lives. And that's how we taught us how to pray. You know? And in cases in the Old Testament where, when the will of God was not known, there was a casting of the lots. But we have uh, the Holy Spirit indwelling us, and he can guide us. We have the Bible as a reference so that we, we can know what we, we ought to do or to understand the, the will of God. Amen? And another thing that I want to emphasize is that and there are answered prayers that mustn't be confused as unanswered prayer. Paul prayed that the thorn in his flesh might be taken away, and God said no. That prayer was answered. Just because God said no doesn't mean that prayer was not answered, you know? And what we, we, we must learn from that is that as soon as God says no, we must move on. David prayed and fasted for his sick child. But as soon as that child died, unfortunately, he picked himself up and he went back uh, to, to normal life, you know. And also sometimes you can pray and God can say yes to the request but not for you. That can happen. David asked to build the Lord, uh, uh, to build a temple for the Lord. God said not you but your son Solomon will build a temple for me. So that can happen as well. We need to be aware of that, you know. And there's also a not yet. Abraham waited and waited for the to have a son. It took a while. But also, we shouldn't look at 
unanswered prayer is a bad thing. It could be a blessing sometimes because it might be an indication that maybe there's something in your life that you need to look into. See if you're in, in right standing with God when it comes to various issues of your faith. So it, we mustn't look at it as a bad thing. It could mean, might not be the case, but it could mean. So it gives you an opportunity to, 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 to reflect and, and something that we don't get much time to do as a people sometimes because of social media and other things. We have very little time reflecting in our lives. And, but there are instances where God says no, but it's a test of faith. The Canaanite woman said to Jesus, Lord, my child is demon-possessed. Please help. Jesus said, no, I haven't come for, for, we have came for the house of Israel. And she insisted, Lord, please help. And, then he, and Jesus said, must I take away the food of the children and, and, and give it to the dogs? And she, she said, even the dogs eat from the crumbs that falls off the table. So sometimes that, that no could be a test of faith. You need to descend. Hence, I'm saying that we need to pray we need to pray that God gives us discernment. We need to spend time in the word that uh, our prayers are not an abomination in the sight of God. Okay? And in closing, before we pray, I just want us to... We've seen that uh, we can have an intercessory prayer for our loved ones and they can be freed from all sorts of things. So before I pray, I just want you to have someone or a person in mind that you want or you, you wish for their salvation. You would wish they would come to know the Lord. It could be a family friend. It could be a colleague. It could be a loved one. This, uh, this teaching this morning is about pray, so we're going to pray. So I'm going to pray, and I need you also in your heart to pray for the, that particular person. Let's lift them up to the Lord, that uh, chains of bondage that might be keeping them from hearing the gospel may be broken. Amen.